All right. Well, happy Monday. I trust everyone is excited to be here and ready for another day of CTE class. All right. Well, hopefully everyone's Maryland flags are finished and ready to roll. If not, I posted an assignment on Google Classroom about how to get everything lined up. And even if you have maybe an alignment sort of snafu or issue, how to hopefully fix that problem. And that's all in Google Classroom. All right, so we're talking about tree identification. And the next thing coming in the mail to you is this packet right here um, with a list of 12 uh, common trees identified by their leaves. And I'm willing to bet that if there's a tree nearby you um, and it's dropping leaves right around now, or you can see it leaves changing color or doing something different, but it's probably one of these 12 trees here. And if it's not, we're going to talk about that in a minute, but it's probably one of these 12 trees right here. Okay, so you'll get that packet. On the front is sort of a picture of the leaf, and the back of the packet, that page, has more information about the fruit and the seeds and the habitat and the bark and all uh, manner of identifying information on the back right there. So that's all, all right there. Now, uh, what you'll do with this is the project is to go out and collect uh, at least two or three different kind of leaves, okay, from trees. Okay, they can't be from a flower or from a shrub or a bush or whatever. They have to be tree leaves from a deciduous tree, a tree that changes color and drops its leaves in the fall. And then what you're going to do is you're going to take the contact paper and you're going to encapsulate those leaves in that contact paper. And I'll give you guys directions on how to do that once that arrives. Um, but you're going to end up with this stained glass leaf sort of situation here. You can hang this on a window or on a glass door. It looks really pretty. And you can enjoy um, the colors of those leaves and the shapes of those leaves for the rest of the season. It's really just a nice kind of fall decoration. But the learning part of this is learning how to identify what kind of tree these leaves are from. And you can obviously use your packet right there. Um, but we're also going to be talking and learning about how to classify leaves by their shape, by their margins, their, you know, their edges, um, by the um, way that they go out like this. And this is called pinnate or palmate, right? Those kind of different things. So we're going to be talking about that. and what you're going to do is you're going to tell me what kind of uh, leaf or leaves they're from once you identify them, and then you're going to give me some descriptor words describing those leaves. Okay, so we're going to get into that in a little bit using what's called a dichotomous key. Okay, before we talk about a key, though, I want to make sure everybody has some maybe some background knowledge in terms of what we're talking about with a dichotomous key. So a dichotomous key is simply a bank of a limited number of answers or, uh, or correct guesses about whatever the thing is you're trying to classify, whether it be animals or plants. Um, and there's a game that famously I think encapsulates this idea. It's called 20 questions. Maybe you've played it with a friend. Um, maybe you've seen the little device uh, game that like Hasbro toys makes or whatever. Um, but it asks you a series of yes or no questions about whatever it is you're thinking about. And the fun part is it kind of magically comes up with the right answer most of the time. Okay, and we're going to play that right now, and we're going to see how that goes. Um, so I'm going to pull up 20 questions, and we're going to see if we can correctly guess the thing we're thinking about, and um, we're going to uh, see if we can stump the computer. So I'm going to go and pull up 20 questions right now, and as an example, I'm just going to come up with um, maybe, let's see, what would be something good to do right now. What if we were to say, hmm, I'm thinking about, you can be an animal, vegetable, mineral concept, or unknown. How about a scarecrow, right? Right now it's kind of a fall sort of day, it's windy, it's rainy outside. Let's say it's a scarecrow, okay? And most of the answers are yes or no, or maybe, okay? But the first one is, is it an animal? Is it a vegetable? mineral concept or unknown. I'm not really sure if it's an animal or a vegetable or a mineral. So I'm going to go and say it's unknown, a scarecrow, none, none of those things. 
Do you use it in your home? Typically, no, you would not use a scarecrow in your home. You would use it out of your home to scare away crows from a garden. Does it have a spine? That's a really good question. So when, if, if you make a scarecrow, you typically stuff it full of straw or hay, things like that, and maybe you will put like a broomstick up there or a piece of wood to prop it up. So, hmm, I'm going to say partly. It kind of partly has a spine, but that's a really good question. It's very specific. Is it brown? Um, partly. You can kind of have a brown scarecrow. Maybe it has a hat that's brown or a straw is brown. I don't know. Does it have whiskers? No. I don't think I've ever seen a scarecrow with whiskers. But some of the questions are easier to answer than others. Is it furry? No, it's not furry. Does it eat seeds? Well, because it's a non-living object, it doesn't eat or breathe or really move. It just kind of stands there and scares away the crows. So let's go ahead and say no. What's kind of funny about it is its job is to make sure other things don't eat seeds, right? You want it to scare away birds that want to get in your crops. Is it native to Asia? I don't think so. I'm just going to make that a hard no. Just a guess. Can it be easily moved? Well, sometimes. I don't know why you'd want it to, but I guess you could. Does it perform? No. Does it have a face? Yeah, a scarecrow does have a face. So you can see we're at Q Q10 here. This is the 10th question. And it's starting to kind of figure it out, right? You can kind of see the program whittling out what it probably isn't, right? And it's trying to sort of get at what it is. So the questions, I think, sometimes get oddly specific. Like the one about Asia, I don't know what that was trying to get at, but um, that was an easy no. But does it have a face? Yeah, it does have a face. Does it live in salt water? No, it's a scarecrow. Is it smaller than a loaf of bread? But sometimes you get these questions, and it might seem like a funny question because I guess a lot of things are bigger than a loaf of bread. But then again, you can think of things that are also smaller than a loaf of bread. So um, I guess you could almost categorize anything in the world by being bigger or smaller than a loaf of bread. But that's exactly kind of the point of what's happening here, right? It is trying to weed out all the things that it's not from all the things that it is. And if you can figure out the size of something, you can kind of head in the right direction. But that seems a little bit off base, particularly because the previous question was, does it have a face? You know, and I feel like we're getting off, off track here. But uh, typically, scarecrows are larger than a loaf of bread. So it's not smaller. No, it is not. Does it eat fish? No, it eats nothing. Does it have four legs? Um, no, it has two legs. So it's Typically shaped like a person. Does it live in a burrow? No. Whoop. You skip one. Uh, does it grow over time? No. That's true. I, I'm gonna click over one kind of quickly. Is it conscious? No. So does it is it aware of you or I or itself as a thing or person? No, it does not. Can it bend without breaking? Um, sometimes parts of it can, I guess, right? Is it smooth? No. I'm guessing it's a cadaver. That's really close. Uh, a little morbid, but close. Does it have teeth? No. Is it cool? Mm, no. Can it growl? No. Is it larger than a pound of butter? I don't know where it's getting these questions from. Yes. Is it a mammal? No. Is it commonly used? No. Is it tall? Yeah. I'm guessing it's a monument. It's getting close. Is it a pyramid? No. Is it lightning? I don't know where it's getting these from. No, it's totally wrong. You won. Um, skeleton, scarecrow. There it is. Is it one of these? It is a scarecrow. So it, out of that, for some reason, all of the things that fit those categories are statue, holder, skeleton, snowman, rainbow, palm tree. Mummy, interesting, lightning bolt, volcano, totem pole, scarecrow, moon, lava, home, oak tree, or ghost. Kind of funny, we're talking about trees today. It gets um, all of these things as possible things. So it is a scarecrow. Good job. You were thinking of a scarecrow.
you said it's classified as unknown. 20 question was taught by the players to answer is a concept. Okay, so there's some learning going on here. So other players typically think of it as a concept. You said it's fine. You said partly 20 Q was taught by the players that it's no. Whiskers, they said probably. I've never seen a scarecrow with whiskers before. I don't know who says that scarecrows have whiskers. Is it commonly used? You said no, 20 Q was taught by other players that answer is yes. Okay, so there are the I guess the contradictions. So I guess the reason why it didn't guess it off the bat was because other people have taught it that the answer that we gave to those questions uh, was just different. So you know, do with that what you will. Um, but a good dichotomous key won't be a Wikipedia, right? It won't be sort of crowdsourced uh, or informed by different people's opinions or thoughts about things. I would argue that scarecrows do not have whiskers, but other players thought that the answer was probably. So uh, myself and other people would disagree about that statement. However, it thinks that scarecrows have whiskers. Okay, we can agree this to disagree. Um, but anyways, that's how a dichotomous key works. I just sort of want to build some background knowledge about what it is we're trying to accomplish. Now, uh, most dichotomous keys with trees are fewer than 20 questions. They're only going to be about four or five questions, if that. Okay. And what I'd like to do right now is see if we can use a dichotomous key to figure out the kind of tree that I have in my backyard. Okay. And I know what it is. I'm going to tell you what it is up front. So we're all on the same page here. Um, and uh, we'll take a look at that right now. So I'm going to turn this guy off. Stop presenting, and I'm going to show you something that I picked from uh, my backyard today. All right. So this is growing in my backyard. It is a um, sweet gum, sweet gum tree. Okay, it's very specific. You can look at the leaves here. You can probably tell me what shape that is right there. If you were to look at that shape, you tell me that it looks like a what? What shape is that? Good job. It's, it's a star. We have star shaped leaves. There's five points on there. The backs are green. And the, uh, the sweet gum tree, as we'll probably see in the description here in just a minute, has this resinous, sticky, very sweet smelling gum that comes out of it, hence the name sweet gum. And um, so that, that's kind of a dead giveaway right there. Really pretty though. I, I look at this morning, oh, it's red, it's green, it's yellow, it's really pretty. Let's take a look at that sweet gum tree right now. So um, using what we know about this, and this is pretty much all you need to identify a tree is uh, maybe one leaf and a small brief, uh, branch sample. And you can do this actually without even breaking the branch off. You can just, you know, you're not going to harm the tree um, by doing it. But you, if you don't want to break a tree branch off and it doesn't belong to you, then just don't do it, right? Just go take a look at it. And we'll talk about something specific about uh, the branching pattern here uh, when we get to this question. So let's go ahead and pull up a dichotomous key um, just for the sake of um, sort of argument here. And I'm going to go ahead and share my screen so we can all see. And this is a dichotomous key from the state of Oregon, it's just one that I like. Um, but inside of the bank, inside of the categories here are all sort of trees that come commonly from Oregon. Uh, now, we don't live in Oregon, we live in Maryland, but Oregon is a deciduous uh, area. Uh, it's a place where the trees do in fact drop their leaves and change color. And so some of the trees in their climate might be uh, similar to the ones that we have. So I'm gonna back up here, this is what I did previously. Okay, and let's take a look at our broadleaf um, question here. From the dichotomous key. Now, uh, it's a dichotomy because there's only kind of two typical right answers here. There's not going to be maybe a, a second or third option for most of these questions. Um, but typically, a dichotomous key will have two a yes or a no, a this or a that kind of thing. Okay? So it's kind of like 20 questions. All right, so we're only talking in this uh, segment about broadleaf trees. Conifers are great. I love conifers, I think they're beautiful. However, they're not what we're talking about today. They're not going to make really great samples for our artwork, and uh, they're not, in my opinion, quite as exciting or fun as um, broadleaves. 
So let's take a look here. It's a broadleaf, meaning it has wide, flat leaves, and they bear their seeds inside of soft fruits. I don't know what the fruits of the sweet gum tree are, but um, I know it's not needle-like, and I know it doesn't have pine cones. So it's a broadleaf, and all the trees talking about will be broadleaf. And it says, is it compound uh, versus simple? Okay. Now, um, this is simple, okay? Meaning if I just pull one leaf off of here, there's only one leaf on here off of this stem or this brachial right here, okay? Um, a compound leaf, as you can see on the picture here, would have multiple leaves coming off of that one center, oh, sorry, petiole, off of the center petiole right there, okay? It is not uh, simple. And uh, there's, like I said, multiple leaves coming off of there. So it's a simple leaf. Now, here's where you need to have a branch sample in front of you or at least have access to the tree itself. Now, there's two possible uh, branch patterns we can have. As you can see in the picture, you can have an opposite pattern where they branch off one for one. One goes up and one goes down or left and right uh, in the exact same pattern across from each other, okay? In an alternate pattern, the leaves alternate from that branch. One goes up and it skips a row, and then one goes up in the opposite direction um, uh, that it alternates, right? So let me show you what that looks like in this uh, sort of branch example here. From um, like kind of the back of this guy, we can see that we have our main sort of stem here, and then we have a leaf coming off here, and then we skip one, and then it goes up over here, and then this one kind of skips one and it goes over here, and so on and so forth. Okay, if this were opposite, it would be very, very clear to us that it was an opposite branching pattern. It would just be one for one. They would be exactly parallel to each other. Okay, so it is alternate. Uh, now, kind of these questions seem a little vague, and um, you get more specific as we go on, as we'll see in just a second here. But basically, by answering simple compound opposite alternate, um, that is actually going to weed out a huge amount of trees, okay? Trees are categorized largely by compound simple and opposite alternate, right? If we can understand those two concepts right there, um, then we can start to identify almost any tree because almost any tree will fit into those categories. All right, so it's alternate. Oops. Just drop the leaf there, that's so pretty. Uh, leaves are alternate on the sweet gum. And then it says, are they deeply lobed or are they not lobed, okay? If you touch your ear, dangly thing right there, some are attached, some are detached, some are detached. Uh, that's called a lobe, but just a little sort of knob or uh, sort of uh, situation going on there. Um, a, a smooth or a not deeply lobed leaf would look like this. Uh, maybe you've seen a leaf like this before. This one actually has teeth to it, if you put closely, kind of rigid teeth there. Um, but for the most part, it's like an oval shape, okay, that leaf, in contrast to our sweet gum leaf, which is in fact a star shape and it is deeply lobed. There are these very defined gaps in between and these very pronounced um, sort of uh, lobe. So it's lobed. Okay, now it wants to know if it's palmately lobed or if the leaves are pinnately lobed, okay? Now that's kind of confusing, all right? But to help sort of solve this mystery here, hold up your palm, the palm of your hand, right? And if you hold up this leaf to that palm, you'll kind of see that it spreads out like the five fingers on my hand and they sort of uh, originate from a center point, just like that, right? And that is a palmately lobed leaf as opposed to pinnate leaf, okay? A pinnate leaf, like this oak leaf, is going to have uh, sort of its stem continue, and then off of there, these little pins, uh, the lobes alternate off of uh, sort of like left and right from there, sort of in this different pattern. Okay, and that is uh, leaves that are pinnately lobed. So this is a tricky concept, but if you understand it and you can like remember the whole like palm sort of connection, it'll make it a lot easier. A palmate leaf looks like this, and a pinnate leaf lobe at least looks like that. So try to like sear that image into your mind. Palmate, pinnate. Okay. So let's choose palmate because it is 
and it wants to know if it is <clears throat> star shaped. Looks like I figured it out. Okay, uh, sweet gum. There you go. Uh, there it is. Now, if it were not that, it would be a sycamore. And a sycamore, so here's your sweet gum. You have a sweet gum nearby you. Uh, there's your example in your packet. Okay, so that one is included in there. And uh, sycamore, I also included as well. Commonly occurring tree nearby you. You can live by a road or a street or a neighborhood. Sometimes people grow sycamore trees because they do really well around uh, leaves and, or sidewalks and stuff like that, neighborhoods. So there's your sycamore right there. Uh, but uh, you guessed it correctly, it is a sweet gum. And because it's star shaped, now that kind of breaks it into those two categories. So it's a sweet gum. There we go. Like I told you before, we just answered the question. We tried to follow it correctly and we end up with the correct result. So what is a sweet gum? It is a easily identified by its five to seven pointed star leaves, star shaped leaves uh, that changes color uh, through a rainbow of colors in the fall. Simple, deciduous, alternate. Okay, so a simple leaf, deciduous, uh, drops and changes color in the fall and it uh, grows an alternate pattern. So apparently there's uh, spiky balls. Okay, I'll look up for those. I don't think my tree is big enough. It's kind of like maybe like six or seven feet tall. So it's probably not ready to, to drop seeds yet. Um, but there's some information about it on there. Um, and uh, in your packet, if you want to know more about the sweet gum tree, you would just turn to that page and read the back of that information sheet. And kind of how this was copied, how this works is there's your picture right there. And then on the exact same side of it, on the other side of that page is sweet gum. It'll tell you sweet gum right there. This says um, a little bit more. Well, here's some interesting information about a sweet gum. A sweet gum, almost everything about this tree is dramatic, from the star shape of the leaves to the brilliant reds, oranges, and yellows and purples they turn in autumn, to the woody brown seed balls that hang pert like cherries from the leafless branches all winter long. Only the flowers are inconspicuous. The name sweet gum refers to the pleasant taste of the sticky liquid that oozes from cuts made in its trunk or branches, and further south the tree grows, the greater the quantity of the gum it yields. As you can see, <clears throat> that resin off of there is what it's referring to, that like ball, bumpy stuff. The tree's genus name, Liquidambar, uh, stems from the yellowish balsamic resin that flows from the bark when it's injured or centuries ago was called liquid amber. The fragrance of this resin appealed strongly to the Aztecs who used it to scent tobacco. Their emperor, Montezuma, made Cortez a present of resin from his own private stock. Fun fact for you right there. So if you want to know more about those trees, interesting facts, and uh, more descriptors of them, on the back of the um, leaf side of your packet will be all the information about the tree there if you're having trouble identifying it. So there you go. Well, once you receive your packets, we'll talk more about what to do with them. Um, I made a tutorial about how to put that activity together, but the sort of the lion's share of this um, next project will be talking about how to identify trees on their leaves, okay? And that's what we're going to do next, all right? So I'm going to go ahead and um, take some questions and comments now, and um, we will uh, have a little discussion.